Welcome to Nursing School Explained and this video on bowel obstruction. Now, bowel obstruction can occur at any part of the small or the large intestine and it can be partial or complete. And we really have to distinguish between two types of bowel obstructions, which are mechanical and non-mechanical obstructions. So the mechanical ones are the more common ones and that's an actual physical barrier that prevents the digestive uh, contents to, to continue moving on further for excretion. And the most common site is the small intestine and it happens because of surgical adhesions. Adhesions are basically scar tissue that form after the patient had had previous surgery. Now the scar tissue affects the small intestine and then basically just kind of clamps down on it and, and, and creates that physical barrier, that physical obstruction. But uh, mechanical obstructions can also occur because of hernias and strictures from Crohn's disease. If you recall, Crohn's disease can cause all kinds of inflammation throughout the GI tract and then can cause mechanical obstructions as well as intussusception. Now in the colon, mechanical obstructions can also occur from cancer, diverticula, or a volvulus. And basically those are again the same thing. Something mechanically now is obstructing the flow of the digestive uh, tract. And this can be cancer or diverticular, those little polyps or volvulus where the um, intestine just kind of collapses on itself. And then non-mechanical obstructions occur because of decreased peristalsis. And the most common one here is paralytic ileus that occurs after abdominal surgery, or it can be due to peritonitis. And decreased peristalsis after par paralytic ileus happens because of several factors. Now, one of them is that the anesthesia itself kind of slows everything down Plus, the patient has been NPO, there has now been some interference with the intestinal system, whether it's a small or large intestine, and so now it's not quite working, and the ileus is basically, I uh, means that the digestive system is paralyzed, it's just not moving. So the, the um, peristalsis, the moving forward, the propulsion of the food is not working the way it's supposed to. But it can also be due to neuromuscular or vascular causes. And so neuromuscular, remember that we need neuromuscular control and we have neuromuscular control and innervation of the digestive tract. And if there is a spine, a fracture in the T or the L spine, that has something to do now with blocking the impulses of the neuromuscular system on the intestine, it can cause a non-mechanical obstruction as well as electrolyte imbalances. Remember that potassium has a lot to do with muscle contraction. We usually just think about the heart when we think about uh, potassium, but hypokalemia can also cause neuromuscular causes of non-mechanical bowel obstruction. So now the patient doesn't have enough potassium for the intestine to move and it gets very sluggish and then causes the obstruction. And then vascular causes, so this is anything that can cause atherosclerosis in the arteries and the blood vessels that supply the blood to the patient's digestive system. And now there is a clot, no clot, no blood flow, ischemia causes non-mechanical bowel obstruction. But again, most common one here is the paralytic ileus and the adhesions in the small intestine. Signs and symptoms of any type of bowel obstruction will be abdominal pain and the patient will certainly be tender to palpation. They might be vomiting and depending on where the obstruction is, if it's higher or lower, it will depend on what the vomit will look like. So if it's a very low obstruction, close in the colon, um, you have to think about that everything is blocked from a certain degree. So let's say it's in the descending colon over here on the left side. So the obstruction is occurring here and nothing is flowing down. So everything else in the digestive tract is backing up. And so the more distal the obstruction is, the more kind of foul smelling and stool-like and digestive um, content the vomit will be because it's nothing can move down. So everything is going to back up 
and the patient is going to vomit that up. But it can be anything from maybe even hematemesis um, or just stomach contents. And then there will be abdominal distension, again, because the patient is very bloated as the digestive contents just back up and cause the, the uh, distension. And it can also lead to rigidity. The patient certainly will be constipated because there is no movement downwards, so no bowel movement occurs the, the, the natural way, no, no um, elimination occurs the natural way. Everything is backing up and then most likely the patient will be vomiting. And then certainly bowel sounds will be affected and most likely they will be increased above the level of the obstruction. So there will be lots of gurgling, hyperactive bowel sounds. And then below the obstruction, there might be absent or certainly hypoactive bowel sounds are very common with this. So then let's look at diagnostic tests. Those include anything from a basic x-ray, abdominal x-ray, to a CAT scan to really identify where the obstruction is occurring and then maybe even identify those adhesions or any kind of neoplasm, diverticular that could be causing this. And then we want to look at the patient's CBC as always, but mostly we want to look at here, A, is there infection in the white count? And B, might there be a drop in the hemoglobin and hematocrit from a possible bleeding, especially if the patient has hematemesis or if there's been a report of blood in the stool that might have happened before, or if there is a history of Crohn's disease or diverticulitis. And then certainly we want to look at their CMP to check the electrolytes because we know that hypokalemia can cause bowel obstruction as well. And if we think about that, the patient is vomiting a lot. Think about acids. The patient will be losing lots of acids, so this can lead to metabolic alkalosis. Now the nursing care and treatment usually kind of go hand in hand because that's what we're there for. Um, but it always depends on the cause, whether it's mechanical, non-mechanical, and of course if it's, let's say, hypokalemia, we want to treat that. But definitely the patient will need to be in PO because we know that nothing is moving downward, the regular um, digestive tract, so we, we don't want to feed anything else into the patient's system. And they will need an NG tube for decompression because even if you don't feed the patient, everything is backing up and all this digestive content has to have somewhere to go. So rather than the patient being nauseous and distended and constantly throwing up, we'll just put an NG tube down. First of all, it helps to get any of those contents out. And secondly, the stomach still continues to produce stomach acid, so we want to decompress that and make sure that we maintain that NG tube properly. The patient will need IV fluids because they're NPO and certainly electrolyte emplacement is not unheard of because we know we have to keep a close eye on their electrolyte status. So that also includes monitoring the labs for H and H drops that we're concerned with and their electrolytes. We want to um, assess their abdominal, abdominal um, area frequently to see is there any changes in the bowel sounds and certainly if you have a patient coming back from any kind of abdominal surgery knowing that paralytic ileus is a very common cause of bowel obstruction we should really be paying close attention to the patient's abdominal assessment to identify these hypoactive bowel sounds the constipation the distension vomiting all these signs and symptoms that the patient might exhibit now, ambulation is very important. Just think about, we always uh, say that ambulation encourages um, bowel activity and encourages bowel movement. So if there's now um, maybe a partial obstruction, <clears throat> we want to encourage the patient to move because it will get the digestive system moving and flowing. And many times, if it's a partial obstruction and not a surgical cause, just by the presence of the NG tube and the ambulation, many times the bowel obstruction will resolve itself. So the treatment can just be as simple as the NG tube, along of course with all these other things here that we just talked about, but many times surgery is not required. But if there is a complete obstruction or cancer or some adhesions that really um, clamp down on the lumen of the intestine, the patient might need surgery. So most likely for adhesions, cancer, or if there's a strangulation due to any cause and then surgery might need in an ileostomy or colostomy 
So this is now can be temporary or it can be permanent. So most definitely we will need to educate the patient beforehand as to what to expect and then certainly how to care for the ileostomy and the colostomy in case they have one of those. And then emotional support is super important here because it has a lot to do with body image, any kind of abdominal surgery, but then imagine that there's a, a, any kind of ostomy there, how that can be taken an emotional toll on the patient. And we might even wanna collaborate with the wound and ostomy nurse and maybe even the social worker to get the patient in a support group or any of those groups that might help them um, recover from this better. Thank you for watching this video on bowel obstruction. Please also watch my other videos on the risk factors such as peritonitis, diverticulitis, Crohn's disease. Um, I'll put those up in the follow-up videos for you as well. Please give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Subscribe to my channel. It helps me keep this going. And then also follow me on Instagram for the announcements of new videos as well as study tips and in-click style questions. See you soon here on Nursing Food School Explained. Thanks for watching.